Hello everyone. In this video, we will be talking about the definite integral. So we have the definite integral, which we'll talk about in this video. And we've already seen the indefinite integral, right? So the indefinite just looks something like this. And this is just the set of antiderivatives of our function f on the inside, right? So we got a whole family of functions. So this is the indefinite. The definite is going to be different We'll talk about it more in a bit, but essentially it's going to have some sort of connection to area regarding our function. And one thing that I'm going to try to make at least a little bit implied is that there's a connection between these. And we'll dig into that connection much more deeply in the future, but hopefully you get some taste of it uh, in this video. So let's try to dig into this through an example. So suppose we have an object traveling in a straight line with constant velocity of 10 feet per second for 8 seconds. How far did this object travel? So should be able to figure out pretty quickly, right, 10 feet per second. I've got 8 seconds. It's going to be 80 feet, right? This is 10 feet per second times 8 seconds. Okay. Well, there are a few ways we can interpret this. So first I want to think about the indefinite integral here. So my 10 feet per second is my velocity. And I said this is a constant velocity, right? So if I want my position function, or my distance here, I'll write it as d, then this is going to be 10t plus some constant. And in that case, well, I know that I've traveled nowhere at 0 seconds, and so it's really just 10t, right? My c is 0 because d of 0 is 0. Okay, and so distance after 8 seconds is 10 times 8, and I get 80. So this is one way to use the indefinite integral to talk about this. So I want to show that this can also be viewed geometrically. So if we graph this, and we've got time down here and velocity over here, what does this graph look like? Well, I've got this constant velocity at 10, and I'm going until 8 seconds. 80 is exactly the area of this rectangle right? 8 times 10 for length times height. So these are two different ways, a geometric one and kind of an antiderivative one to view the same concept. So let's look at another one that maybe isn't quite as simple. All right, so here uh, we'll say we're in a video game. I don't know, I've been watching League of Legends videos lately even though I don't play the game. And so you're walking in a straight line, you're moving 10 feet per second for four seconds, you're walking toward a battle, and then someone hits you with a stun, and you're frozen for two seconds, and you can't move, so you have velocity zero. You miss this fight, and then you're all sad, and so you, you trudge back in the direction you came for a couple seconds at a slower pace of four feet per second. So same question. How far have you traveled? What is your net distance? Let me say that. So what is the net distance here? So in this case... Right, I want to think distance from home in terms of net distance. Uh, so, well, you can do, okay, we did 10 times 4. We moved 40 feet. Uh, then, well, we got 0 from when we weren't moving. And then we have 2 seconds where we're going back. So this velocity incorporates direction, right? So if we're going back the way we came, this should be 2 seconds times negative 4. And so we should get 40 minus 8 and get 32 feet of either displacement or net distance, however you want to think of that. What's this graph look like? Well, again, here we have you know 10 for a bit until we're at 4. We have 2 seconds where we're not moving at all. Uh, let me actually just do this in red. And then down here at negative 4, we have another line from 6 until 8, right? And so now what I'm looking for in terms of area is this, except for here, right? This is 40. And this is going to be, well, the width is 2 and the height is 4. So this is 8, but it's below the x-axis. And so I will consider this negative 8. So we again can view this either geometrically or, you know, as this is like a 10t plus 0 plus uh, negative 4t, and then viewing the different time gaps. So then you might ask, what if velocity is not constant, right? Or at least not constant in chunks. 
So we've seen things like this, right? We've done position velocity acceleration problems. So think about if our acceleration is negative 32 from gravity. And I'll just give example where our initial velocity is 64. So we would have negative uh, 32 t plus 64 for our velocity function. And in this case, you can think of like throwing a ball upward. So our initial velocity is 64. It's going to end up coming down. Uh, and I want to know its height in general. So my height here would be negative 16 t squared plus 64 t. And it hasn't, it's starting from the ground. So uh, the constant here will be zero. Okay. So if I want to know what's like the max height. Well, the max height is going to be when that velocity is zero, right? So it should occur when v of t equals zero. Well, that's going to happen when t equals 2, right? Because you'll have negative 32 times 2 plus 64. And so h of 2 is going to be uh, negative 16 times 4, so negative 64 plus 2 times 64, or 128. So we get a max height of 64. So it travels 64 feet up. Let's look at this graphically. So if I've got my velocity function, again, I want velocity and time. So what's going to happen here? I start up at 64, right? And then I have slope negative 32. So here I'm at 32, at 1, at 2, I'm hitting the x-axis. And then that's where I'm hitting my peak height, right? And then I'm going to keep going until I hit the ground. And, you know, this would be at time 4 in this case. So why, or what's really going on here? Well, again, we've got this area, which is the height as it's going up, right? And we have an area of a triangle, which we know. So 1 half, the height is 64, and my base is 2. And so I get 64, matches my max height, right? And then you start coming down. And so when is it going to hit the ground? Well, it's just going to be symmetric, right? It's going to come down, and this would be width 2, and this would go down to negative 64 down here. So now we're ready to define the definite integral. So it's going to be the signed area, total signed area on an interval from A to B. So let's just look at a picture here. So say my F looks something like this. Then the total signed area counts everything below your graph but above the x-axis. So the stuff in blue as positive, and then it's going to subtract away the area below the x-axis but above, right? So this would be counted as negative area. And so this end result is our definite integral. So it's written using the same symbol roughly as the indefinite integral, except we have these additional points A and B here, which are called the bounds of integration. And Hopefully this feels at least somewhat properly motivated here of why we would use the same symbol, that there is some connection to the antiderivative. Namely, if we take the definite integral of a velocity function, right, I'll just call it vel of x here, that we're really going to get out uh, the distance or the net distance from time a to time b. And of course, we have this connection with something we already know that the indefinite integral of your velocity is going to be your distance. And so hopefully we see some connection for why we're still calling it an integral and using this symbol. So for your first exercise, I want you to consider the function below and find the definite integral from negative 2 to 4 of this function f of x. Okay, so let's think about how to compute for functions if we're maybe not given a graph, but using geometry. So here, if I see 3x plus 6, well, I know how to graph this, right? So this is a line of slope 3 through the point 0, 6. And I know that my x-intercept here is going to be at negative 2. And so then at negative 3, I'm going to be down at negative 3 right? And then at 1, I'm going to be up at 9. And so the area I'm talking about here is exactly this shaded region in red. 
So what I can do is basically split this up, right? So this piece here on the right is positive, and this is a triangle. So my area is 1 half times, so negative 2 to 1 is going to be 3, and my height is 9. And so I get 27 halves. And then over here, I have 1 half, my height is 3, and then my width is just 1. Uh, but we can think of this height as negative 3, or you can put the negative at the end. It doesn't matter. The point is we want to count this area as negative and subtract it away. And so we're going to get negative 3 halves here. And so our end result is 27 halves minus 3 halves, or 24 halves, which is 12. So let's take a look at one final example here. So this one is most definitely not a line. Uh, but maybe it looks familiar. So if you see square root of some square minus x squared, you should be thinking circle. And this minus sign here should get you thinking bottom half of a, right, the, the bottom semicircle of a circle. And in this case, our radius would be 2. So we're looking like, okay, we've got negative 2 to 2, negative 2, 2. And so this guy is our function. This is the negative, the square root of 4 minus x squared. But we're only caring about the part from 0 to 2 for our x. So we're looking at this quarter circle. Well, you know in general, right, the whole area of the circle would be pi r squared. And so if I'm looking at the quarter circle, I'm going to divide it by 4. My r is 2 here. And so I'm going to get exactly pi. 4 pi over 4. So for your second exercise, I want you to look at the integral from negative 4 to 4 of the square root of 16 minus x squared. And you should be using a picture and some geometry here in order to calculate this, right? You want to be thinking in terms of area. All right, thank you for watching.